morning and a delicious lunch. Um, this session, unfortunately, um, Dr. Rebecca Young wasn't able to get a flight. Her flight was cancelled, so unfortunately she's not able to be here in person. I know she did want to be, of course, but due to modern technology and things that have passed my kind of capability, she's able to join us online. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Young is from the Darwin Institution, uh, Institute where she's a conservation biologist and today she's going to talk us through the conservation standards which is an adaptive management tool that Darwin have been implementing now um, for quite a number of years and she's going to tell you um, about how this works. A, a general overview, there's quite a lot of bits and pieces to it but she's going to give you an overview to that and maybe this might be something that you can take on board when you're developing your conservation strategies or evaluating your conservation work. And um, just before we hand over to Rebecca, I just want to say that there will be moments when you will need your phone um, and your glasses, probably, um, to partake in polls and, and whatnot. Okay, so uh, there will be questions afterwards, uh, which Rebecca can answer from the comfort of her home. Uh, so I hand over to you, Rebecca. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and yes, massive apologies from me on behalf of the airline um, that I can't make it. I'm really disappointed to not be there in person. But very happy that we can I can still deliver this for you and uh, we should be able to still have a good question and answer session. Um, so yes, as Andrea said, I am Becky and I work for the Durham Water Conservation Trust. Um, and I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the conservation standards, of what they are and why they make, why, why might they be useful to you. And so, sort of jump straight in, we'll start by thinking about, uh, the, the reason we want to think about this is considering the role of zoos in conservation. So, um, from looking at, from sort of um, Iyaza's perspective, there's lots of different uh, considerations that Iyaza as an organisation have. And one of their focal areas is maximising the conservation impact and engagement of our members. Um, and so they provide guidelines on the definition of direct contributions to conservation. And so what things can we do as zoos um, to increase our contributions to direct conservation? So they fall into sort of six broad categories. So we have habitat, so we can look at habitat uh, interventions, so supporting on the ground with restoration activities, whether it's through sort of capacity building, funding, or directly being involved. There's the one that's probably the one that most classically we would think of as a zoo, is species and populations. So whether this is um, breeding for reintroductions or for safety net populations, <coughs> genetic management, there's all kinds of ways that zoos can contribute uh, through this avenue. There's also research, another crucial element where um, this may be sort of research from in the field or it may be research from within our institutions, uh, which can have a lot of direct uh, contributions to conservation. There's also conservation education and capacity building. So whether this is training staff to be able to work on the ground or um, sort of providing um, training to the general public, uh, there's different ways that we could have conservation impact in that way. Through advocacy, so whether this is in providing support on things like <coughs> making legal changes, making protected areas, providing support on that. And then finally, through grants and fundraising. So as an organisation, we may provide funding to uh, maybe local stakeholders or people on the ground to do conservation work. So there's a huge range of ways that we can get involved and ways that we can um, contribute to conservation. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about sort of some, some thinking about how we can work this into our planning. Um, so to just go through sort of a few of those examples of those. Um, so thinking about habitat restoration. So within Durham, we do a lot of work on habitat restoration um, in different countries. And a lot of this has been actually driven initially by our species work. So we started on focusing on a specific species, and then this has driven us to restore whole habitats. Um, as I said, one of the sort of very classic examples we would think of from a zoo perspective is breeding. Uh, so again, whether this is breeding for reintroductions, like the Madagascar Pot Chard, 
or the pink pigeon, which as well as breeding for reintroduction, were doing a huge amount of genetic work to understand the genetic health of both the captive and the wild population and see how we can best manage the population for long-term sustainability. Uh, which brings us very nicely onto research and training. So as I said, we can do the sort of genetic research to understand populations. Um, and then also within an organisation, we, we may have less endangered species that, that zoos hold in their collections, which can be really useful proxies for helping us to develop the techniques that we need for um, actually uh, working in the field. So one example of that is we work with the St. Lucia racer, which is the rarest snake in the world. But given that they're such small, small populations, we needed to understand how we could work with them first. So we used a proxy species of an Antigua racer. So that's some really important zoo-based research um, and training in that. Uh, and that training, as I said, not always uh, with um, practitioners, it may be with the, with the general public. So public engagement and aiming to improve nature connection is another way that we can um, help to sort of deliver a conservation impact by working with people and helping to promote uh, nature-friendly uh, behaviours. Um, and then again, thinking about this uh, capacity building and delivering courses. So within Durham, we have the Durham Academy, um, and the EASA has an academy, and I'm sure many of you will come from it. Many of you will come from institutes which also deliver sort of your own sort of tailored training work. Um, so there's sort of a few ways we can contribute. Um, so thinking of as well about how we move from the zoo to the field, and that field picture is there a bit earlier than it should be. Mm -hmm. um, but so one of the things that EASA aims for is for members to work from the assumption that we can and are obliged to do whatever is possible to protect nature both in the field and in our institutions. And this in the field element is kind of what we want to focus on today. Um, so one thing that I think is uh, one of the really big things that we want to sort of address and think about is what barriers exist for making sure zoos are able to contribute towards conservation. And this is the first example of where um, we've got a bit of, sort of interaction. Um, so I have here, uh, as long as it all goes well, um, we should be able to get a word cloud up for you. So, yes, yeah, so uh, it would be really great for me to get sort of some ideas from you on what some of these barriers are that you feel exist for making sure that zoos contribute to conservation. So if you scan this QR code, then it should just give you the option to input some words, and then we'll get sort of a bit of a word cloud start to build up. There we go, it's actually brilliant. Um, and that is one that absolutely I was expecting to come up. Um, so yes, we, we all know, and I think it's something that we're sort of painfully aware of, is the issue of funding, um, and hopefully that's something that we'll be able to address a little bit today. Um, yep, yeah, there we go. Money, knowledge, lack of time, uh, local partners, very important. Again, something we'll be thinking about. Um, resources. So I thought it would help if they didn't all move around, that makes it harder to um, keep track of. Yes, yeah, so I'll just give you a few, more, uh, few minutes to kind of keep adding to this. Um, and I think, yes, we can definitely see some of those words are okay. staying up there as ones that have been contributed a lot. <laughs> so I think I will uh, put a pause on there um, so that we can start to have a little look through and think about some of these. Um, so I'll just give a minute for everyone's responses to be registered and for just moving around. Um, yeah, there's some really good points there. There were some of the ones I was expecting to see, for sure, but then also some, um, sort of, yeah, some additional ones that maybe we don't always think of. Um, so yes, as, as I said, the first one that came up was funding. Uh, so we've got funding, we've got money, uh, resources, capacity, they're all, all in there um, and it's something that we will be thinking about when we're thinking about planning. Uh, a big part of the, sort of the purpose of the conservation standards is to help us be as effective and as sort of well planned as we possibly can be in order to maximise the resources that we do have because we're all I think very aware that resources and capacity are limited 
Um, and so anything that we can do to maximise those resources and that capacity is uh, something that would be really beneficial. Um, staff, staff time, time, again, as I said, thinking about how we can maximise uh, our efficiency is something else we'll be thinking about in here. Um, something that I will say now, kind of before we go into the conservation standards, is when you first think about these planning tools, it may seem quite daunting and it may seem that a lot of time needs to go into that initial planning. And to an extent that is true, you do need to put time into the planning, but also there are lots of different tools available to try and help sort of tailor it to um, the time that you have available so that it, it becomes a useful tool for you rather than another burden of something else that you have to do. So even though there will be quite a lot of information, there will be quite a lot to learn about the conservation standards, I hope that we can get across to you that it's, it's a useful tool and it's maybe not quite as daunting as it might seem to begin with. Um, a couple of other things that have come up are, so we've got a lot of uh, political ones, uh, political points have come up, that is of course very important. Um, I think, oh yeah, local partners has come up, and that, so again, that's something that we'll be talking about. Um, collaborations, again, very important, um, a very important aspect. Um, so yes, that's been, yeah, really nice to kind of get some of your ideas on that. Um, and yes, hopefully, we'll be able to address some of these today. Uh, so I'll just drink out sounds like a presentation. Um, perfect. So, some of the common challenges that I think we have all addressed in that that I've thought of before, uh, things like effective monitoring and impact evaluation, so this kind of all comes into that thing about capacity, um, how can we do things more effectively. Uh, funding, absolutely a point that came up, so whether we can come up with ways to apply for funding to fit our plans, rather than work the other way around, rather than thinking what funding pockets do we have available, what can we do with those, having well laid out plans and getting them, and going for funding to drive those, um, and engaging with local communities and stakeholders, and I said that was one that came up a few times in sort of different ways of wording it, all really important. Um, so some of the kind of questions that we would think about in this case are, are you clear on how you contribute to conservation? Um, are you confident that your actions and your decisions are having a contribution? Um, are you able to measure the impacts that you're having? And are your plans adaptable? And I think there's going to probably be people in the room coming from various different angles, depending on what it is that you might be looking to do. So is it we've got people who are looking to run their own programs uh, for the first time and they want to ensure that they're spending their money appropriately? Um, and that you know that they're going for the appropriate actions. We might have people who are looking to seek partners. We're looking for better ways to sort of manage and plan partnerships. And we might have people who are looking more from a donor perspective. So you might be interested in sort of planning how you might make sure you're giving money to the right uh, organisations. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to address all of those um, to some extent. And the way that we can do that is by looking at the open standards for the practice of conservation which is uh, also called the Conservation Standards. So this is an adaptive management tool. So first of all, what is adaptive management? So it's the integration of project design, management and monitoring to provide a framework for testing assumptions, for evaluating and adapting, and for learning and sharing. And the idea is that it combines uh, research and actions so thinking about conservation actions and research in the field, um, which are we're looking at sort of a slightly more sort of results driven within the field. Um, and then we may, looking from sort of the other end of the spectrum, we may be looking sort of gathering knowledge, thinking more about conservation actions and research within a zoo. And so this isn't a perfect model, but it's sort of how it's how the field to zoo um, translation sort of best fits into this structure. Um, but the idea is that adaptive management sort of sits between the two and helps us to bridge this gap between what's going on in the field and what's going on in the zoo. Um, and this sort of very basic, man basic project management cycle is first you plan, then you do what you planned, 
you monitor it to see if it's worked, if it hasn't worked, or if it has worked, you make adaptations needed, and then you sort of continue this cycle. So that's the basic project management cycle. And the conservation standards is uh, an adaptation on this adaptive management cycle, which is tailored specifically towards conservation. Uh, and so this was developed by the Conservation Measures Partnership. They developed it and they managed this work. And the idea is they want to seek better ways to design, manage, and measure impact of conservation actions, with again this focus being making the best use of limited resources. So the conservation standards is the set of tools and processes which help to effectively manage conservation projects. Um, it's a fully integrated planning tool, and the idea is that it is an ongoing cycle of management and review to help you to sort of plan what you're going to do, but then understand how it's working. Um, it can be applied at a huge range of scales, from species, going up to sites, going up to landscapes, but then also it can be used to consider some sort of quite different avenues. So it can be used to plan funding, and it can be used to plan working with the public and these sort of things. So there's a lot of different potential applications, and I'm going to go into some examples of those. Um, there is accompanying software that you can use, uh, which is called Moradi. Um, it's not essential, so I'm not going to go into lots of detail on it today, but it is something that's available as a resource if people would find it useful. Um, and so the Conservation Measure Partnership is a group of leading organisations and agencies who have developed this open standards for conservation. Um, and the idea is that it's based on the best practices from a diverse range of sectors, and it's an active global community, so there's members of the Conservation Measures Partnership from across the world, um, and it's used by large NGOs and donors. Uh, and so these are the contributors to the Conservation Measures Partnership. So you can see there's uh, a huge number on there, um, a large group, uh, various different networks. Um, and the Conservation Standards is in continuous development. So this is just there taken from the Conservation Standards website. So you have all of the information there that you need actually on the Conservation Standards, on delivering them, there's lots of guidance available. There's information from the Conservation Measures Partnership. And there's also the Conservation Coaches Network, which is something that I'll come up to a little bit later, but it's one of the many avenues that you can go to if you want support in um, delivering conservation standards within your organisation and facilitating workshops. There's this big worldwide network of coaches who are available to help. And as I said, it's been continuously developed. Um, and one of the things that's currently in development is a lighter approach to the conservation standards. And so this is where I said that you know sometimes um, the time commitment to do this kind of planning may be too much, and that's exactly what they're developing this. It's uh, at the moment it's sort of a recipe for conservation. So this toolkit will take different elements from the full conservation standards plan and help advise people on whether they do need to do a full plan or whether actually they can do this sort of lighter approach. And this is currently in development, um, and there is actually a CMP webinar on this uh, in, I think it's next week, but it's in the coming weeks. Um, so if you're interested, then um, we can share the link for signing up for that webinar. So that's a, sort of a brief overview as to what the conservation standard is, uh, what sort of who, who manages the conservation standards. But now, why would we use it? Um, so why are we encouraging it? So it's designed to design more effective and transparent conservation interventions. Uh, it helps to base fundraising on strategic priorities and goals. So as I said earlier, rather than thinking about what we can do based on what funding pots we might have available, it, the idea is to flip that around and have the goals and the objectives that you want to achieve and use this to drive your fundraising um, to hopefully help you obtain what you need to have these impacts. Um, it helps us to understand results and adapt accordingly because, as we've said, the problems with limited capacity and resources, we absolutely don't want to be just doing something that's not working. We don't want to have implemented some actions, turns out they're not really having the impact that we wanted or they're not having any impact, but we haven't got any sort of means to adapt, so we just carry on and we end up wasting time and resources. It's the last thing we want. So this helps us to address that by um, 
providing a tool to adapt our work. And it also creates a central source of information on the project. So one of the things that came up as well was thinking about partners and also thinking about local partners. If you have got people contribute to a project sort of spread all over the world, it's really useful to have this central hub of information, um, which allows everyone to access and share the same information on the project. Um, and then finally, uh, it facilitates the effective sharing of learning and use of evidence. So something in conservation that we're, I think we're definitely getting better at, but there's still work to be done, is sharing what we've done. So what has worked, what hasn't worked, how can we share this with other people from different organisations? Partly to stop uh, people from making the same mistakes, um, so being able to learn from each other in that way, and also to be able to promote the things that really work really well um, and make it easier for people to learn about that and to adopt those strategies as well. So that's the, the brief overview of it. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on some of the steps. So we normally deliver the conservation standards within the Durham Academy in a five-day course. So obviously I'm not going to be able to go into everything today um, because the last thing you want is five days worth of information in two hours. So I'm going to sort of go through and pick out some of what I think are some of the sort of key things that will be useful for you to know about and to think about what we could do um, and hopefully sort of give you a bit of an overview as to how you might find this tool useful. So there are these different stages in this cycle. So assess, plan, implement, analyse, adapt and share. So I'm going to start with going through some of the important elements in the assess phase. So this is the phase where we're sort of first thinking about who's going to be doing it, what are we going to be doing, what threats are we trying to, to, um, to affect, and what is the situation on the ground? So what, what are we actually trying to deal with? So first, and very importantly, we think about project teams. So this will be both internal and external people. Um, and again, some of the things that were mentioned again earlier, one of the things that came up was a lack of knowledge and a lack of skills. So we need to consider the skills and the knowledge that we need. And this can help us in identifying the project team. It may be that within our organisations, we don't have the capacity to do some of these things. So, for example, if we want a genetics work done, we may not have the skills and the capabilities to do that. This might be a prime option to collaborate with the university and see if you can get sort of an academic partner to be a member of the team to help fill in some of those knowledge gaps. So it will help us understand who we may need to, to bring on board. It allows us to define the roles and responsibilities, make sure everyone's very clear on what they should be doing, um, so that we don't have sort of confusion and things being missed out because people didn't know their responsibility. Um, we need to recognise that the team composition can change over time. Just because we've set at the beginning, it doesn't mean that that's rigid, um, and it may change, and that's absolutely fine, that's part of this sort of adaptive cycle. And it's also a great opportunity to engage with local partners, which again was something that I noticed came up on our word cloud at the beginning, and um, the importance of engaging with local people. Um, and that will be a bit of a theme that comes up a couple of times, because it's really, really important uh, to make sure that we're not sort of coming swooping into a site and enforcing things on people without considering the impact that this would have on local people. And so it's really great to have local partners involved. Um, and there's actually, uh, organisations that help support people in doing this. So it's the Principles for Community-Based Conservation. Um, they, I think there was, it was hoped that they could have a session um, at this forum, unfortunately that wasn't able to happen. But they have got lots of really helpful resources if this is something that you're interested in learning more about. So they've got sort of their own online toolkit, um, and this is just sort of a snapshot from that online toolkit, um, but they've been working with the Snow Leopards Trust. Uh, and so you can access a bit more information on the work that they've done uh, through this link. And the, the presentation will be made available as well. So there's various clickable links in there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really helpful in supporting people thinking how they need to engage with local communities. So then the next thing we think about is the type of project. So what is it that we want to do? Is it, and there's a huge range of different projects. So it could be developing sustainable fishing projects could be managing a protected area, be restoring endangered species, tackling a, a global problem like the like trade. So there's a, huge, a number of very different levels 
that we might be looking at. And this is just a tiny selection of the types of products that the conservation standards can help planning with. But when you've thought about the type of project that you want, you need to think about the scope of your project. Um, and there's a few sort of different ways that you could do this. It could be geographic or it could be thematic. So you may have a place-based scope. You might be really quite focused on just one protected area or one national park. <coughs> um, you could have a target-based scope where you're thinking about an individual species. And as I said um, earlier with our work with Durrell, quite often we've started as a species-driven um, project. So at, within our organisation, our um, mantra is saving species from extinction. So we, a lot of our work starts with the species uh, and then this can also kind of drive wider projects and larger projects. Maybe a thematic scope. So it could be that you're looking to compass specific so something like catching or unsustainable fishing. You may be looking to restore ecosystem services, so things like water purification, uh, or it may be capacity building. So another one of the really important ways that we can have a conservation impact is through building capacity. So there's this huge range of different project types that we can plan using the conservation standards. And so in order to determine, once we sort of have thought about what level we want to be looking at, then we need to think about what is it that we're trying to have an impact on. And so this is our conservation target. So an element of biodiversity on which a project is chosen to focus. So again, this could start at the species level. We may be looking just at one single species with our project. We maybe have a slightly larger project which might look at communities, so rather than just a single reptile, we may look at a reptile community. Or we may go all the way up to ecosystem level. And so as I said, um, for example, our work in Mauritius started very much species driven, so we had very focused projects looking at rescue of the pink pigeon, rescue of the Mauritius kestrel, uh, rescue of various highly endangered reptiles. And as the work has progressed, it's moved more from not just looking at single species to looking at whole communities of the species and up to looking at whole ecosystems. And again, these are how um, the, it can sort of fit in with some of those IASA um, conservation, um, direct conservation ways that we can do it, so whether it's species or habitats. So once we've thought about what our target is, we then go into what's called the viability assessment. And this is essentially getting to know your species. We want to understand the most important ecological requirements for the healthy target. And so it's really important for, um, for us to just have a really strong understanding of what we're starting from and what we want to see. Um, so we, we, as part of this, we identify the current status of our target, whether that's a species or an ecosystem or something else. And then we consider the desired future status, so where do we want it to get to? Um, and it helps us to set goals for the desired future health of the target. And this is something that also I'll come back to quite a lot, is that the, when we're thinking about this, our conservation action plans are driven by the desired outcome. So again, rather than thinking, oh, we've got this pocket of money, we can maybe do this, we're thinking, right, what do we want to see? What is our objective? And that's going to guide our planning and how we deliver our work. Um, and then we can also think about all of these things about understanding the health of the population. We also think about how can we measure these. So this is where the monitoring and the impact evaluation considerations start to come in. So we might be looking at population size if, it's, if we're just sort of looking at species and we're considering the abundance of the species is a, an indication of a healthy target. So we might consider the population size. We might consider something like the water quality. You could be looking at habitat connectivity if you know that you've got very fragmented populations and actually a healthy target would be um, to deal with that fragmentation. Um, or you could look at another sort of numerical estimate of something like the number of nesting sites. And again, this is just a handful of examples from a huge array that you could choose. So once you've thought about um, what your target, what you want it to look like, some other things that we need to consider are the threats. So what is it that we're looking to target? Is it invasive species, forest clearing, disease, poaching, invasive species overfishing? 
or a huge array of other things. So we think about these, and this helps us to get that good on the ground understanding. So we're this early stage, we're trying to really just consider what the situation is, consider what we need to be addressing, um, and this will also feed into understanding the situation on the ground. <coughs> and these specific threats can be linked to the targets. And so this, again, is all building up that picture of the, of the conservation on the ground. So once you've considered what the threats are, you look into a little bit more depth as to how severe the threats are or how, how sort of imminent the threats are. So I'm not going to get into that. There's sort of a lot, a lot more detail on that level of how you consider the threats. But once you've looked into the threats in more detail, it can help you understand the impact they have on your targets and help understand the sort of the really important places to put your resources. Um, so, as I said, we kind of link them all together. So we think about conservation targets and we think about their threats. And so, just for a couple of examples, we have the plowshare tortoise is one of the species we work on in Madagascar, and a huge threat for this species is poaching. Um, so huge numbers have been taken from the wild to go into the illegal trade. Um, we have another example target of the tail fesking, um, a native Mauritian reptile. And there's various different threats to this one. So invasive predators are a really important threat. Habitat degradation is another really important threat. So again, we're thinking about what we need to consider and how they're impacting our target. And then sort of the final thing that we use that puts all of this together and helps us to really understand the situation that we're starting with is what we call the situation model. So this is the visual diagram of a situation analysis which helps us to represent the situation on the ground, the relationships between key factors, and it can help us to understand and identify where we can intervene on this. So, it, as, I, as I said, it presents the evidence. Um, so any evidence that we already have about the situation, about the work we're going to do, is presented in this model. It helps us to understand complex problems. We may go into this thinking, OK, we know that uh, something's affecting this species, we can think about the threats, and then also when we start to think about it in more depth and have contributions from lots of different people with different perspectives, different expertise, we can start to really tease apart these problems and understand where different elements are coming in because you, you will sometimes have, and this is a benefit of having a diverse team, problems that uh, local people may be aware of that we're not aware of if we're sort of coming in and looking at the situation from externally. And similarly, people just with different levels of expertise, people who maybe think about more the, the genetic side of, um, of population viability, again, just getting those external and additional inputs can really help us understand the problems. It helps us to identify key stakeholders who may realise that there is a threat that we need to address, and in order to do that, we need to engage with certain people in, um, to be able to support us in doing that. And it can help highlight points of intervention. So where is it that we're actually going to have the biggest impact? It might be that we thought about doing a certain action, but actually from looking at this, if we took a step back and did something earlier on, we could have more of an impact. Um, and in the end, it's used to help us to, uh, to develop effective strategies. So on the next slide, I'll show you uh, an example of a fairly simplified situation analysis, but just to give you an idea of the kind of thing that you would end up building. So you start with your targets. So this is uh, an example from Mauritius. So there's a few different targets. So the palm savanna, the reptile community, the giant tortoises, and the seabird community. So then we've, we've identified the targets that we want to preserve. And then we think about what are the direct threats to those? What um, is having an impact on them? So we have invasive plants, invasive predators, poaching and severe weather, all potentially threats to these targets. So then, once you've, you've got that, we sort of take a step back and think about what is it that's influencing these threats? What are the factors that go into these different threats? And these are where you start to get this bit, bit more of an idea of the situation. So invasive plants and invasive predators, they come from somewhere, so they've come from an introduction. And then we think, okay, so they've been accidentally introduced what might have led to them being accidentally introduced. Um, inadequate biosecurity controls, 
all poorly applied by security controls, okay, what's led to these? So it helps you sort of think back and understand what is actually leading you to the threats. And by doing that, then you can see what needs to be addressed. Where can we, where do we need to target our interventions to sort of cut this chain off as early as possible to avoid getting to that threat? And you build this up for all of them. And this is a small snapshot of what can end up being sort of quite a, a big document, which can help us to understand the situation and see where we're going. And then something else that is uh, kind of a useful thing to think about, which uh, it won't necessarily come into all projects, but it might be, um, might be in some of your projects, is thinking about human well-being targets. So sometimes the humans are going to be affected by conservation targets. So for example, um, if the target provides an ecosystem service, so things like water quality, that can have big impacts on human well-being. Um, as with pollinators, so that's something to think about. Um, and then the other way of looking at it is, how are humans affecting our targets? So sometimes, um, hu well, very often, human interventions are going to be major factors that we need to address. So things like hunting the target species, deforestation of the target ecosystem, so things like slash and burn agriculture, obviously has a very negative impact on the ecosystem. But these are often important parts of people's livelihoods. So we need to think about um, how, as well as thinking about how humans are affecting our targets, have some consideration of how our interventions are going to affect people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and this is where this sort of community conservation that Partners was talking about is really important to, to consider uh, because we may need to come up with things like alternative livelihood strategies if we're saying to people, well, you can't do slash and burn agriculture anymore because this is now a protected area. How are we going to support people in um, still getting the income and the food that they need? So it helps us identify things like that as well. So that was a very much a whistle-stop tour of the assess phase. Um, a lot goes into the assess phase because there's a lot for us to understand. But um, hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of some of the key things that we think about. Um, and how some of the ways that this toolkit can be very, very helpful. So the next part of the cycle is the plan stage. So it helps us to sort of define our strategies and think about the assumptions that we have to make within them um, and setting goals and monitoring. Um, so as I said, it helps us to set strategies. So a strategy is a set of activities with a common focus that helps us to achieve specific goals and objectives. So essentially we're asking, what is it that we're going to do? Where are we going to do it? Who do we need to influence? And again, crucially, when we're setting our strategies, we're driven by our objectives. So what do we want to achieve and how are we going to do it? And so we're, when we're defining strategies, there's various different sort of groups that they could fall into. And again, these fit with the different ways that we can influence conservation. So we could be doing target restoration. So reintroducing a species that can directly improve the target viability. We may be looking at threat reduction. Um, so for example, removing invasive weeds, but which helps to mitigate this important threat. Um, or we could be doing enabling conditions. So providing training, which helps the strategy to be more effective. And again, these are falling into some of those uh, specific ways that we can do conservation through species and populations, habitats, and conservation education and capacity building. So when we're thinking about developing these strategies, um, it's going to be a collection of actions which work towards an objective. And the conservation standards provide a lot of guidance on how to develop your strategies and how to prioritise your strategies. Um, and this is one where I'm not going to go into more detail on it because we just don't have the time. But as part of this uh, framework, it helps you to think about the potential impact of the strategies that you've chosen and how feasible they are. And through that, it, it basically helps to prioritise them. So which ones are going to have the biggest impact? Um, and uh, yes, to help to choose which would be the best ones to follow. Um, there's some important things that we have to think about when, when doing this, we are always going to have to make some assumptions. Um, so when we're thinking about the strategies that we're going to do, 
we want to think about how well are we expecting them to work, and we're going to have to make some assumptions for that. You know, we, we will assume, hopefully based on evidence, so where possible we can look at uh, other interventions that have done it and use that as evidence, but we assume that our situation, for example, is going to act the same as the one, the example that we've seen. So we assume that if we follow these protocols, our reintroduction will work. Um, and then we also think about how sure are we of these assumptions. A lot of the time, we may have some really good evidence that we're going on, and so we can be quite sure of it. But sometimes we might be trying something novel. We might be having to make quite a big assumption. We're not sure of what we actually are going to need to test it along the way. And so the conservation standards helps to offer planning tools um, to help you document these assumptions. And a really important one of this, which um, people may well be familiar with from other toolkits and other methods, is a theory of change. So it's a series of causally linked assumptions about how we think that actions are going to help to achieve the results that we're looking for. Um, and so these theories of change can be uh, visually represented in a results chain. So we start off with our strategy, and the end goal is our target. So what is it that we're trying to have an impact on? And then we make assumptions about the results along the way. So we expect that certain results will be achieved. If those results are achieved, then we expect that we'll see a reduction in the threat, and as a result, an improvement in our target. So um, yes, so the strategic action that's implemented, the threats that are, that are addressed, and the outcomes that are achieved are considered, the reduction or mitigation of the threat is considered, and we expect then that the, we would see a viability maintained or improved. So this is a really, really helpful tool, even if um, you don't end up wanting to use the full package and do the full conservation standards plan, just thinking about theories of change can be really, really helpful in helping to understand what your work might look like and where you might need to make changes. So when doing a theory of change, we use the if-then logic. Um, so I'll go through an example of a chain afterwards and that will become a bit clearer. Um, it helps us to make sure we're not making major leaps of faith. So as I said, sometimes you're going to need to test assumptions because you may not be com completely clear on something. And we may have a, an instance where we go, well, if, if this is happens, then we assume that we're going to get this out and actually, it's quite a big assumption and you've just sort of jumped to it and said, well, as long as we do that, then it'll be fine. And having a theory of change helps us identify that if we do need points where we need to just make sure that things are actually happening rather than just assuming that they will. And it helps to focus on the achievement of the results rather than the implementation of activities. So again, being objective driven. So in this example, we might be thinking about the reptile community on Mauritius. And strict biosecurity is an important um, strategy to help maintain the our community. So thinking about that sort of if-then logic. So we have this part of our strategy of introducing biosecurity. So we, we kind of go along the chain and like, okay, if the two protocols are understood and implemented in staff, then sufficient staff capacity to identify and remove problematic species should occur. And as long as this stage is occurring, then the next one will. So effective species, uh, invasive species are effectively controlled. If, um, uh, if invasive species are effectively controlled, then we're mitigating the threat of invasive activities on offshore islands of Mauritius. And this is a very simplified version of a theory of change. There are, of course, other smaller steps in between. But this just gives you the basic idea of you're thinking about what needs to be put in place. Because if you just said, strict biosecurity controls are introduced, invasive species are effectively controlled, then that would be a leap of faith. You're just assuming that they're going to work and actually you have to think about making sure they're well understood, making sure that they have the capacity to implement them, making sure they are implemented. So it just helps to address those leaps of faith. And as I said, it helps to make you realise if there's any points that actually you do need to test and monitor and make sure they are actually doing what you expected. Which nicely brings us on to monitoring. Um, so it's crucial for us to understand if we're achieving what we set out to do. Um, and unfortunately, monitoring is not always done effectively. It's something where it's quite common to fall into the trap of, I'm just going to collect all the data, I'm going to, I'm going to record everything that I think could be useful, which 
has its merits in that you kind of you, you're not missing things, you're gathering everything. But if you haven't got a well thought out monitoring plan, then there's a good chance you're going to be collecting a lot of information that you're not actually going to use, um, which is a prime example of not having the best use of our resources. So to um, help avoid this, the conservation standards helps you come up with a monitoring plan. And this is by setting goals and objectives. So these are sort of along that theory of change, thinking about what you are expecting to achieve. So what, what you're aiming to achieve in the end goal with your target and what other sort of smaller objectives you need to achieve along the way. Um, and it helps you think about how you're going to monitor them. So what is it you need to assess to make sure you're achieving what you want to? And what's the most effective and efficient way of monitoring them? With this kind of a bit of a highlight on only measuring what you need. So to again, make sure you've got consistently collected results so that you can compare sort of year on year, but you're not collecting unnecessary data that's actually going to just be wasting your time and not get used in the end. Um, so again, if we're thinking about an example of a reptile community, there's a couple of different uh, things that we might want to look at. So we may be interested in the diversity of the species, so maybe that's what we want to be monitoring and collecting data on. We may be interested in the abundance of the species, um, so collecting data on that. Um, but what, uh, the idea is that all of these um, ways that we're monitoring them should be what we call smart objectives. So they're specific, so you know, we're sort of saying by a certain amount of time we want to achieve this, rather than just sort of saying count the abundance, we're going for something more, more precise. So specific, measurable, achievable, results orientated and time limited. Um, so time limited means as in sort of by 2025 we want to see these things happen. Right, because otherwise you could just say, well, we know what we want to achieve, but we don't know what we want to achieve it by. So again, these have um, more information in the conservation standards um, guidance about how to think about um, setting the, the most appropriate ob objectives and how each of these sort of criteria can be met. So that was a, kind of a brief thought on what goes into the planning stages. Um, the implementation stage is going to be kind of a much more sort of brief overview because it, it doesn't, um, it's not something that is so necessary for us to go into now. But some of the things that it helps you do is to set an annual work plan. So thinking about the budget, the timings of when you want things done because certain activities may be uh, sort of seasonal so they need to be done at certain times. Uh, and thinking about who's going to do them. So again, if you've got seasonal surveys that need to be done, do you need to have a bit of extra capacity at that time? So help me to think about that. Um, the implementation of activities. So some of the elements that go into sort of really successful projects when it comes to implementation are having a clear vision, what is it you're trying to achieve, having robust strategies that you've thought about and you've planned well, having strong leadership, um, so making sure everyone knows what they're doing, uh, stakeholder engagement is another key one. Sometimes you may, you may not be able to achieve what you want to achieve unless you have the, the buy-in of the relevant stakeholders. So again, that's coming back to that earlier thinking about the project team. Um, having good communication that can be really crucial um, if you're, you, you know, you don't want people repeating the same work and that sort of thing or things being missed. Regular tracking. So. Um, thinking about your monitoring plan, what is being tracked within your monitoring plan and making sure that you're sticking with that. And also being adaptable to change, which I think is probably something that we've been, become painfully aware of over the last few years, that very large things can change and the, the pandemic being a prime example of it was so difficult for so many people to deliver their projects the way they wanted to. Um, and so having ways to help us manage this and to be adaptable when the situation change. Again, one of the things that came up a lot on that um, initial work plan was politics. Political changes, political unrest can also be really impactful for us, particularly in a lot of the uh, countries um, where conservation work is done, this is a, an important consideration. So being adaptable to that change. Um, it helps us to collect and manage data. Um, so again, it helps planning that monitoring and um, also giving us plans for how we're going to store it because that can be a huge thing, you, you know, having lots of survey information collected in the field 
how is that going to be stored and translated to um, everyone involved who needs it? Are we just going to have one sheet of paper that's collected in the field, but then we may have teams across the world who need to use it? So how are we going to do that? Um, and then evaluate some of this information to help us to monitor the change. Um, and think about the lessons learned, any challenges that we had, what changes we might need, um, and regularly reporting on the progress. So thinking about how regularly we need to report, what the audiences are, is it for fundraisers, is it for stakeholders, and um, thinking about that. Um, and one thing, this one should have been with the collector manage data, but this is one thing that we can do in Maradi, so that's the software that I mentioned. Um, as part of the, uh, the collecting and managing data, we can do sort of regular reviews on how the work is going um, and looking at all of the actions that are planned um, and seeing whether they have, um, whether there's been major issues with them and if there are, identifying what they are, looking if we need to adapt, whether they're on track or whether they're completed and then you get this sort of progress pie chart. So in this example, you can see that a quarter of them have been completed, just over a third are on track, then we've got a small number that have major issues that we need to address. So that's quite a nice way of being able to keep track of the progress of what we're doing. Um, and then there is the analyse and adapt stage. So we've collected all this monitoring data, we need to analyse it and review the results and the progress. And adapt the difference is free. Um, and actually this is something that is, as I said, the, the conservation measure partnership is sort of constantly uh, evaluating, coming up with new uh, new useful tools and one that's being worked on at the moment between USA and Foundations of Success is they're putting together um, a bit of a uh, more detailed toolkit to help people with this analyse in a different space. So giving you more guidance on what you might need to do in order to do your adaptation. So that's um, being worked on at the moment so that will be more resources that will be available in the, in the relatively short term future. Um, but, but some of the things that we're thinking about at this stage are, are we doing the right things? Are we doing them well? And are we achieving impact? And it's kind of going back to that idea of having this adaptive management to help sort of bridge this gap. So did we do what we said we would do? And was it effective? So taking the information from the field and taking it back and looking over it. And then the final part of the cycle uh, is sharing. So, documenting our learning, sharing our learning, and fostering a learning environment. Uh, and so this is really important, as I said, to help us prevent the same mistakes being made if people um, have, are doing the same things, and also to share our successes. And there's lots of resources available um, if you're interested in this. So, Maradi, which is the program that the Conservation Standards use, has um, an online uh, presence called Maradi Share. And this aims to foster a learning among different conservation practitioners around the world. And it's really helpful as well if you are sort of starting to think about doing a conservation standards plan because there's loads of examples on there. You can see how other people have used this tool to plan. You can look at people's theories of changes and, and get a good understanding from it. Um, there's also CAMEL, which is an open source library housing um, generic results chains for conservation actions. Um, and I can vouch for how useful this is because I've actually pulled a couple of examples from Camel um, for the presentation today and it's really helpful if, if you know, you're, you're coming up with a theory of change that's maybe something you've done before and you would like to see how other people have done it, this is, gives some really, really good examples. Um, there's conservation evidence. Um, so again, this allows you to search from evidence from scientific literature. So. As I said earlier, hopefully, we'll be able to, um, in a lot of cases, we'll be able to use evidence to back up our theories of change and what we expect to happen. This is a really great resource for looking for examples of that and to help you understand how to make your translocations as effective as possible or your culture breeding as effective as possible. Um, and then there's also um, this conservation learning initiative where you can explore capacity building, partnerships, research, monitoring, flexible funding, there's lots of information uh, from the Conservation Learning Initiative. So they're just a few of the avenues that people can use to, use to share their, their information and to learn more. Um, and of course, 
as it's a cycle, we then repeat it. So, you know, we, we look back at the situ initial situation model, have things changed, do we need to add any additional threats in, um, and then go through the cycle again. Um, so that was my very brief introduction to the conservation standard cycle. Um, hopefully that's given you an idea of some of the ways that it can help you, um, some of the important elements that can be, that go into each of those stages which may be useful for you and your organisation. Um, and as I said, that was very brief, but there is a huge amount of other support training available. So the Conservation Measure Partnership, as I said before, it's a group of NGOs, government agencies, funders and private businesses, and they're the stewards of the conservation standards. Um, so they're working on it and developing it, bringing about these, these new things, so things like the Conservation Standards Toolkit for people who want a lighter version, the um, extra resources to help in the analyze and adapt phase, that's all being developed by the Conservation Measures Partnership. Uh, and they're constantly looking to improve uh, the conservation practice. There is CCNet, which is the Conservation Coaches Network, which also I, I briefly mentioned earlier. So this is a network of coaches who are trained in the conservation standards. And there's over 700 coaches worldwide, and they have regional groups across the world. So they're available and um, great people to contact if you're interested in applying this and learning more about it. Um, and then there's also Moradi, which is the software that supports all the steps of it, of the conservation standards, and it's both desktop and cloud-based, and that cloud-based version is where there's lots of different examples that you can look at. Um, and then here is a list of links, which again is going to be more useful to you when you actually have the slides and you're able to click on the links. But um, CMP have a mini webinar series. There's lots of webinars available online that you can look at. Um, and then they've got sort of general presentations to overview. There's a self-paced course uh, online, which helps you work through what goes into the first couple of steps. Um, there's conservation standards PowerPoints, which are available in uh, both English and French. Uh, within Durrell, in the Durrell Academy, we offer training courses, mentoring, workshops and facilitations for organisations that are interested in adopting the conservation standards. So I've put the contact email for my colleague in the Durrell Academy who can help you if you're interested in finding out more about that. And then there's a couple of other online courses as well. So there's one here that's run through the University of Wisconsin um, and Arcado Conservation who offer training and coaching. So a huge bank of places that you can go to if you're interested in learning and finding out more. And um, so the next stage I'm gonna to go to is talking a little bit about putting the conservation standards into practice. So I've given you all sort of the, the general overview of it, um, but why, why do I know about it? How have I been involved with it? So putting it into practice. So within Durrell, we adopted the conservation standards organisation-wide in 2018 as part of our Rewild Our World strategy. Um, and so I'm going to give you some examples of how we've applied it within our different programmes and how we've applied it to look at sort of Different, uh, different ways of uh, doing conservation. And all the way through, it's been driven by the end goals and the objectives that we set as part of our strategy. So we set these goals, and then we thought about what do we need to do to achieve them. And this is how we've used the conservation standards. Um, and then also, I'm just going to sort of wrap up, once I've gone through some examples, finish off with some of the things that we've learned as an organisation from adopting it. So our successes, but also some of the challenges that we had. So going through uh, some examples of sort of different types of conservation and how the conservation standards can be applied to these different types. So I'm starting with species and populations, going with, as I said, the maybe more classically, what people might classically think of as how zoos contribute. Um, so I'm thinking, using this one, of the example of the pygmy hog. So this is the rarest and smallest pig in the world. Uh, and it's native to the sub-Himalayan grasslands. And our end goal and our sort of objective of this was wild populations. So the goal is to have self-sustaining wild population of pygmy hogs in the sub-Himalayan grasslands. So this is what we're working towards. And then we have to think about what do we have to do to achieve that? Um, and so something that is really important is obviously there are huge merits in captive populations so 
whether this is for safety net populations, for research, for genetic management, all kinds of things. But a really important element is getting individuals back into the wild. So that was what we chose for our focus of this one, is how are we increasing the wild population? Uh, so we have a captive population of pygmy hogs. We've got, there's a breeding center in Assam, India. Um, and so what we really need to think about is how are we getting this captive population back into the wild and contributing to the wild population? So I'm going to just go through the theory of change for this one. Um, so the target is the pygmy hog. This is what we want to see, wild pygmy hogs. Um, and we wanted to see a self-sustaining population of pygmy hogs uh, to begin with in the release site. So this is again sort of a simplified theory of change. Uh, so we're starting off in the release site of wanting to see self-sustaining population. So um, the strategy that we start with is uh, managing a healthy breeding program of pygmy hogs for release. And then, so we again do the sort of if then thinking. So, if we manage this healthy population, then we have captive, uh, captive hogs which can be prepared for release. Uh, and then, pygmy hogs can be released into sites within protected areas. And then, these healthy pygmy hogs are present in the site, and then they can go on to be self sustaining populations. As I said, this is quite a simplified version of the theory of change. But that's sort of where we're going. So how has our healthy population in, in captivity been translated into a population in the wild? So that's a, a first sort of quite basic theory of change of thinking about that. So then thinking about other ways that we can intervene, so maybe habitats. So thinking about Round Island in Mauritius. So this island um, had the native flora very, very severely degraded by non-native herbivores. And we're doing lots of work to restore this. Um, and so this is an example where you may have more than one target. So we're looking at the ecosystem. We're also looking at the reptile communities. So that's giving us two different targets. But what's going to be really important for both of these targets is the natural regeneration of the native flora. So this one uh, strategy is hopefully going to impact multiple targets. Uh, and the strategy is planting to restore a functional plant community. Uh, and then I'm not going to go through all the stages of it, but this is what's gone into the theory of change. So we're thinking about if we do this planting, then what steps do we need to be seeing? So thinking about things such as the optimal planting sites for species survival, that's the first thing we need to consider. We can't just say, well, we're going to plant them and they're going to survive. We need to consider where's the best place for them to supply survive, select the best, best site, and then actually go through the process of having the seeds, getting them ready for translocation into the site, caring for them once they've been planted, to help them to reach maturity and natural regeneration. So these are all the sort of steps that need to be followed. So we, we wouldn't just assume that planting uh, new seed, uh, new plants, sorry, is going to give us a natural regenerating fish. Um, and so then to move on to another example of uh, the, the type of conservation, so thinking about research. So the black lion tamarind is endemic to the Atlantic forest of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and this is uh, a very endangered species as a result of habitat fragmentation. So huge amounts of the forest has been lost, and it now just lives in small fragments. And this species nests in tree cavities. Um, but because of the fragmentation, there's, there's a lot of um, reforestation going on. But these newer trees that have been replanted are not mature enough to have cavities. So this gives us a problem. So even though there's new trees being planted, we don't have a suitable nesting site for um, black lion tamarind, which results in them being exposed to predators um, and results in mortality. So we're thinking about what is it that we're trying to achieve. So our goal is to have um, increase the number of groups um, within uh, the certain forest fragments and improve their genetic health. And you may also have multiple goals. So as well as this goal of increasing the number of tamarinds, we're also looking to increase the use of these newly replanted forest corridors. So making sure that they're using this newly developed habitat for them. But as I mentioned, there is a problem with this new habitat in that they don't have tree cavities. So something that we need to think about is providing them 
with suitable um, refugia within these newly planted habitat, uh, newly planted forest corridors. So uh, we can have a strategy of providing safe refugia for wild black lion tamarinds. Uh, and again, we can come up with a theory of change for this. But this theory of change has a slight problem. So we've said that if we provide nest boxes, there, so we'll, the nest boxes will be de de designed and deployed in the forest. These nest boxes will then be used by black lion tamarinds, and as a result, there'll be a reduction in predation, and we'll see these improved, these improvements. But one of the key things that we're thinking about with our theories of changes is avoiding leaps of faith. And we've not managed that. So this is quite a major leap of faith to say, we're going to design a nest box and put it out in the forest, and they're definitely going to use them. We don't know that because, you know, we're designing something new. And if, the, if they don't use them, then that's obviously been a waste of resources that we've just put them out and they're not being used. So that's a leap of faith that we need to consider and think about more. So this is where uh, research can be really, really useful. And it's a lot of work that has been done uh, within Jersey Zoo, is researching the optimal designs for nest boxes. So putting in different nest box types, um, which are all are slightly differently designed, but to be anti-predator, and seeing which ones the tamarinds use the most, which ones they're um, yeah, most likely to use in the wild. And also considering things like the materials from them, what materials last longest, what are going to withstand the elements the best. Um, so then we have this slightly more in-depth theory of change, which factors in this thinking about research and the optimal design, how we're going to um, pilot the use of them. And then sort of further down the line, we would have the rest of the theory of change where they're actually being implemented. Um, and so that's a a great example of the importance of research and how we can consider um, the steps that we need to think about in our research projects. Um, and then, so the, the fourth way that we have of um, delivering conservation is through education and capacity building. Um, and this is something that we've done within Daryl, it's a very different way of applying the conservation standards, but we've still done it and still found it to be really effective. So, using both the learning team and the Daryl Academy, we've developed conservation standards plans for both of them. Um, and so you go through the same process of assess and plan and implement and adapt, but you just have to look at it from a slightly different angle. So, in this instance, our targets weren't things like species or ecosystems, but the targets were things like zoo visitors, school groups, and um, maybe those targets had to be sort of slightly divided up, so we, we um, established that the way we engage with primary school is going to be quite different with the way we engage with teenagers. Um, so having sort of different targets for them. And also conservation practitioners. So these um, top few are through the learning team within the zoo. And then the conservation practitioners is more the focus of the Durham Academy. Um, and so we think about, based on these targets, what are we actually trying to see? So what are our goals for these targets? So one of them is increasing nature connection um, with the intention that if people feel more connected to nature, they'll be more inspired to protect it. Um, increasing the number of teenagers considering a career in conservation. So trying to engage with this target group and seeing how, what, what strategies we can deliver to help engage with this group and encourage conservation um, careers. Um, and increasing the number of people trained in animal husbandry, for example. Um, so thinking about the sort of training that we're able to offer. So this one is a very different way of applying the conservation standards. When I first was sort of introduced to the, the fact that we'd done it on the learning team, I thought it sounded quite strange and I couldn't quite see how it would work. But actually when you look at it, you can see that it can be applied in very different ways, really effectively still. So even if you're looking more at uh, rather than sort of on the ground plans, but more sort of um, engagement plans, it can still be really helpful for you. Um, and then here are a couple where I looked at that uh, the camel uh, example that I gave you, where they give lots of examples of um, of conservation standards plans. So again, one of the ways that uh, zoos can get involved in conservation is through advocacy. Uh, and so this was an example of. Um, using the conservation standards in planning land and water use zoning. 
So the, the, fit, the target for this was species, ecosystems and climate, so there's multiple targets. Um, and the idea is that they wanted to look at the implementation and enforcement of zoning over a long term. So there was a strategy in uh, looking at the designation and then the theory of change that came with this. So this is just an example of a very basic theory of change uh, from this kind of example of the things you would need to think about if you're looking to do this sort of advocacy approach. So thinking about things like key individuals and relevant authorities that need to be involved, that's a very early thing you need to consider. Uh, and then going through the different stages of the theory of change for that. So that was a nice example of, you know, one where I haven't necessarily had experience with it before, but actually I could go and look, use this resource and see an example of how I might look to start building a theory of change for that. Um, and then something else that I sort of briefly mentioned earlier, which does come into this one as well, is human wellbeing targets. So because this is focusing on, you know, this, this zoning is focusing on improving ecosystems, that can increase ecosystem services, which in turn have human wellbeing targets. So you, you may see that through the work that you're doing, you're having this included effect of improved human wellbeing. Um, and then final one I'm going to talk about is fundraising and grants. So some zoos will be coming from the perspective of, you know, we have funding and we want to provide, we want to support a project. Um, how can we use the conservation standards to make sure we're choosing the right projects to support, we're spending our money in the right way. Um, so again, it's kind of a, a standard theory of change from the, the CAMEL examples of how you might uh, do a grant programme to fund more effective conservation. So, there we go. so you can start with thinking about sort of a good funding, funding programme and then you find a good funding programme as having clear goals and a clear approach to, to the, de the definition of your grant programme and also a clear communication to potential grantees because you don't want to be, you know, what's the point in having uh, a grants programme if people who would apply for it aren't hearing about it. Um, and then again, they said there's a sort of good fundraising, uh, funding programme implementation and the definitions of a good one of that are developing a strong review process. Um, having good customer service is important for people to be able to get the questions they need, uh, get answers to questions they need when they're doing their applications, um, and having a solid review and decision making process. And if all of this goes ahead, then the funds can be used to implement better projects. So awardees are able to use the fund to implement their better strategies or to implement more strategies. Uh, and also, you may have people who are sort of just on the cusp of being able to do what they want to do, but they're just not quite there, and so you can help make that difference to people who are sort of close to that budget margin. Um, with the then expected outcome that effective strategies are implemented and then they have a on their conservation targets. So that's uh, an example of sort of a basic theory of change of how you might um, sort of plan your, your programme for funding. Uh, but then something else that is important to think about is um, as well as being able to sort of do these theories of change for how you want to plan your funding, it could also be really useful if you are providing funding to a programme to have a good understanding of this kind of adaptive management planning um, and the conservation standards to either, it, it may not be something you want to enforce, but you might want to encourage um, people that you're funding to use conservation standards because then that helps give you confidence in the plan that you're investing in. So you can see that it's a well um, thought out plan, it's been thoroughly um, considered, including things like the important stakeholders, uh, and they have the ability to analyse and adapt. So, you know, you're, you're not going to be funding a project that's just going to sort of keep rolling on even if it's not quite doing what they want. You can have some confidence that you're funding a project who can analyse and make sure they're actually doing what they're setting out to achieve and adapt if they're not. So, to sort of hopefully make sure that your money is being spent as well as it possibly can. So, again, it's, it's not something that you would necessarily say you have to do a conservation standards plan for us to fund you, but if people have done, then it can be really beneficial in your decision making. And also just having a good understanding of it uh, will be helpful in the decision making. Um, so finally, as promised, I will sort of give you a bit of an insight from our side. So learning from our experience and sort of the successes 
of the experience when we applied the conservation standards across Tyrol. So one of the big things has definitely been a better understanding of the situation on the ground. So that initial stage of making a situation analysis where you're sort of pulling together all the information on the, the status of the species and the threats and the evidence that you have to support all of these, bringing that all together to really understand the situation has been really beneficial. Particularly because we work across a range of sites. So we've got sites in um, Brazil, in the Galapagos, in Madagascar, Mauritius, India, in the UK, in Jersey. They're very different situations. So we're looking at some very different species with very contrasting threats. And there is, of course, some consistency, but there's huge amounts of differences. So to have all of these situations well understood and well documented is really helpful for us to keep track of all of this. Um, and another thing that I mentioned earlier that was useful is having a centralised plan. So obviously, as you can see, our um, the programmes we're working on are very spread out across the world. And as a consequence, so are our teams. We've got a huge team in Madagascar, but they're also supported a lot by our team in the UK and similarly in the other sites. So having a centralised place where we can all see and feed into the same plans is really helpful. It's had funding um, and prioritising benefits. So as I said, something that is really something that we're working towards and have worked towards since we implemented this is um, making our plans and then going for funding to reflect what we're planning. So it's helped us with doing that fundraising and prioritising where we want to put our resources. It's improved our monitoring and tracking of impact. So again, we have, as I, as I showed in that um, pie chart earlier, you can go through all of the actions that you're doing uh, and, and say a six monthly review or a yearly review and say what is on track, what is not on track, where do we need to make changes? And it's been really helpful for helping us to keep track of that. Um, and also, um, actually slightly going back to the centralised plan and also going to back to this one, it's really helpful if you have staff turnover so maybe you might have seasonal staff or you may have someone who leaves during a project. By having this tracking of your monitoring, that information that they have in their head isn't lost because you've got it all in the centralised plan and you've been keeping track of it. So that's also really, really helpful. Um, and then also it's a really good communication aid. So things like even just the theories of change can be really useful to illustrate the work that we're doing and how we're getting there. So it's been helpful for aiding our communication as well. So there's certainly been a lot of benefits for us um, from adopting it. That's not to say that there haven't been challenges. There certainly have. Um, so one of the biggest challenges I think that we had was that we, we rolled it out organisation-wide very rapidly. Um, and this is something that we're not the biggest organisation. We're not sort of the size of um, people like WCS. They're much larger than us. But also we're, we are larger than a lot of, sort of more small zoos. So by sort of rolling this out all in one go, we didn't necessarily have the benefit of everyone fully understanding it, fully buying into it before they started to do the planning. So we would really encourage uh, training people to get them on board first. So having people, even if it's just sort of some introductions, looking at some of the webinars and some of those resources that I um, provided in the earlier slide, to get people sort of more on board and invested, because it can sort of feel like until you get to the end, it doesn't all fall into place. So if you've got people who are being made to make plans, but they don't fully appreciate the end benefit of it, then it, it was more challenging to roll it out. So to get people on board first and sort of have everyone a bit more sort of trained and clued up, you should have sort of happier people who are more invested from the beginning um, and have a strong understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, some projects do change a lot. Um, and this one can be, I think, quite a lot that driven by things like political change. Sometimes you do just have to really change what you're doing. Um, so there is this negative that sometimes you maybe can't push through with a plan. You have to change it too much. But those early stages are still helpful. So things like the situation analysis, even if you have to completely change what you're actually doing, 
you still have all that background information which you've gathered and developed, which will still be helpful when thinking of your new plan. It is time consuming, or it can be time consuming, and this was again something that did come up as a concern early on um, in that word cloud at the time. Um, and to do a full conservation standards plan, again, it depends on a case by case basis. It does depend on the complexity of your project and on the number of partners you have involved, but it it is something that we would do sort of workshops. We'd get everyone together and do workshops on it, which could take a lot of time, particularly if you've got multiple stakeholders and partners from different countries. It can be hard finding a time for everyone to come together. So again, this is where we have these other options. So if it, you feel it is going to be too time consuming to do the full thing, we have these lighter options of the Conservation Standards Toolkit, um, which is the one that's being developed by the uh, CMP at the moment. Um, and then indicators and monitoring. Um, this is something that is a super valuable part of the, of the um, conservation standards. Is it helps us with our monitoring plan and with defining the good indicators. But something that we found, and that also I know colleagues in other organisations who I've spoken to have found similar sometimes, is that in the first round they've maybe put in too many indicators. And actually, when we looked back at the plans, we would put in indicators of things that were not really necessary to monitor to answer the questions that we wanted to answer. So regularly revising the plan was really helpful. So we've just, um, I've just helped in the sort of revision of one of our plans and we've just gone through and said, okay, what question are we actually trying to answer? Is this indicator contributing to answering that question? No, it's not. Okay, we don't need it. So that's something that I think is a trap that's quite easy to fall into of um, thinking you need to sort of record every single indicator. But again, as I said, it's something that you can um, revise as you go on. If you realise that actually you've got indicators in there that aren't beneficial, then you can revise and take them out, which is the beauty of this um, completed cycle. Um, and so when, as I said, when we did that, we considered what is it essential for us to report or to understand the impact and what is actually there. Because it's nice to know, but it's actually not essential for us to know. Um, and that helped us to trim it down a lot. Um, so that's, uh, yes, some of the challenges that we had and some of the lessons that we learned from it. Um, and that brings me to the end. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I realise there's a, kind of a lot to go through, but I hope it's been useful. And we've now got plenty of time for questions. Rebecca, that was really, really interesting, and a lot, a lot went into that. Thank you so much. So, do we have any questions <coughs> in the room? Yes, Esther. Do you need the mic? Where, where yes. am I going? <laughs> Hi. Um, it's just a, a basic question about the costings of the training. And do you look at um, kind of differentiated uh, price depending on who it is you're training? Because obviously some smaller in-country NGOs that may really benefit from this might not see it as um, a cost that they can uh, afford. So, you know, how, how, is, is it a blanket cost structure? for the training and or, or to take part in the, the training? Um, so it will vary kind of depending on the different um, resources that you use. So there are some some of the resources that are on that link, well actually a lot of the resources that are on that page of links are free resources. Um, so it includes um, online presentations um, which will have a lot of background information. Um, one of the training courses which I think it was the it, it's very thorough on the first two steps, that's a free online course. Um, so a lot of them are freely available anyway. Um, in terms of the sort of more tailored courses, I actually, because I'm not within the academy, I'm actually not too sure of the prices, um, but I can happily find that out and share that with you. Um, and the, also depending on sort of who you go to, they'll have their own different costings. Um, so I'm not sure, I can't actually provide uh, an answer on if they 
either blanket costs or if they do discounts depending on um, on where people are coming from. But I know that certainly there are a wide variety of free resources. Um, and the CC Net Coaches Network, again, you can reach out to, to coaches um, and ask for advice. And then I think, again, it will depend on the sort of level of engagement that's needed. If, they, if they're going to sort of facilitate something fully, then there might be a cost associated with it. But asking for information, um, sort of an initial guidance, then there, there can be, um, yeah, sort of free options from that. But yeah, so it is, it, there is some variation, but there's certainly a lot of free resources. Great, thank you very much. Do we have another question? Any more? Oh, yeah. It's just... Um, I was just thinking back to when you were talking about the measuring, um, you mentioned to only measure um, what's necessary, um, but I would have thought it would be useful to kind of gather as much data as is feasible and realistic. I, I just wondered the kind of thinking behind limiting what, what information is, is recorded versus kind of, kind, of, kind of gathering as much as possible. Yeah, so I mean, to an extent, it's a bit of a balancing act um, because obviously it, it would be very frustrating if further down the line you go, oh, I, I wish I'd collected that. But something that we find a lot is that when, if people haven't really thought through what they want to, what they want to test, what they want to monitor, then you may just think, right, I need to monitor everything. And it might be that, you know, whilst you're monitoring certain key things, other information is just there when you're doing it. Say you're doing a survey, it's, it's minimal effort to add in a couple of extra things, then that's not so problematic. But if it's that you've not really planned what you want to um, monitor and you're going to do huge amounts, which are a lot of extra work and a lot of extra capacity without actually having a clear benefit to them. So it's not necessarily saying collect the minimum amount of information. It's more saying, don't just assume that you need to collect everything if you don't actually have the capacity to do it. And so think about the capacity you have. And if you do have the capacity to collect more and it's not going to be, you know, draining on your resources, then by all means collect more. But if you have limited capacity and you can't collect everything, it helps you to have a really good plan of, okay, what are the necessary things that we really do need that we can focus this limited capacity on? So it's more a case of sort of optimising and, and finding that balance of getting a good amount of information without collecting everything possible and actually stretching yourself too thin um, and wasting time and resources. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Simon has a question. Thank you, Becca. Um, I'm just uh, curious about investigating your uh, rollout at Durrell a little deeper. So, did you have um, specific challenges uh, getting this integrated into how you work, and and what did how did you go about dealing with those? I imagine just uh, lots of people want to go out and get on with it, and um, how did you deal with that? Yeah, so I am, um, so the rollout was actually before my time, but I can give you, I know some of the, certainly some of the challenges that came with it. So at the time we had um, our effective, we have, well, we have a conservation effectiveness team for a start, which is a benefit that not all organisations will have. We're quite lucky in that we have a team who are dedicated to things like evaluating our work, uh, organising our plans and helping with the monitoring of them. So having a team dedicated to doing that was really helpful. Um, and the conservation impact manager at the time was, uh, she's a very, very experienced in the conservation standards, a member of the Conservation Measures Partnership. So she had a huge amount of expertise in doing that. Um, so then the rollout, the, the big challenge, you're, you're, you're right, in that people do just kind of want to get on with it. Um, and I think there was some, not pushback, but some, some some initial thoughts of, no, I just kind of want to go and get on with this and get this done. Um, we had to do it, sort of, we couldn't do all the programmes at the same time, uh, because we had one person facilitating the all of these work, uh, all of the workshops that went into doing these plans. So we started 
with some of the uh, certain plans and then sort of have rolled out gradually to get them all done. Um, but I do know that there's part of the work that I did when I first joined Durham was looking into, um, was just sort of doing some evaluation of how our rollout had gone. And some of the work that I'd done was sort of interviewing members of the team who have been using it. And there was certainly some shift in people who at first thought, I'm so practical, I'm so hands on, I just want to be out in the field doing this. We normally have plans that we don't necessarily keep going back to, and I just want to get on with it. Um, but then having actually experienced it and gone through the process, and I think they were at the end of the first cycle, so I had already done some, some of these sort of the analyze and adapt stage, they were very much converted and they could see the benefit and they could see the impact that it had on their program of being able to um, sort of track the changes. So certainly there was some resistance at the beginning in the sense of, you know, I just want to go and get on with things. But once that we'd had the time to kind of go through the, the process, I think the benefit certainly has been sort of appreciated from doing it. But yeah, I would say that it was very beneficial that we had a, a team um, whose purpose is that they affected this team whose purpose was to do that. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Uh, question at the back. Hi, Simon. Uh, hi, Ed. about the analyze and adapt part. Uh, don't you think it's important to incorporate in any program like that also exit strategies? Uh, to any kind of program, especially when we deal with uh, wildlife and so many things that can go wrong and sometimes it's important for everyone who is involved in, in the project at the beginning to understand whether there will be our uh, fail points and points of no return, for example. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, and I, um, I believe that that is something that is in the, um, within the guidance. Um, so I, at the top of my head, can't think of how they are in our plans. Um, yes, I'll just, sorry, just a, the slight caveat is I am, as our impact evaluation manager, not available. I'm not fully involved in all of the plans, and so I'm not sure where we have those, but I'm sure that there is elements within the planning that help to consider that. Because um, obviously, you know, it's a cycle, but cycles don't necessarily go on forever. So I think that there is advice on that. Um, but I can look into it further. And if, if you would like to um, contact me after my email is in here, if you'd like to follow up, then I can look into that better for you. Sorry, that wasn't the, the greatest answer. Thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, exit stress is very important. Yes, question. <laughs> Thank you and, um, for the presentation. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, in the place when the big hawk was uh, released in, uh, in the wild. And uh, uh, coming back to a concrete uh, uh, action in terms of uh, uh, cost also of the project, I'd like uh, if you agree to uh, divide it in the three steps preparing the project, run the project, and monitoring the project. So there are three different costs, and the monitor uh, is special. There are two different uh, uh, kind of monitors, uh, short term and long term. Uh, so I, I like uh, uh, if you can uh, go back in the uh, relationship between cost and action that you do, and uh, at the end, uh, if the costs are also uh, shared with the local authority or provided only from your fundraising strategy. So just to make sure I'm clear on the question, so the question is sort of how we incorporate the costs into the different steps and thinking about that in terms of our strategy and also from the local perspective, is that right? Yes. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so there's obviously there are, as you correctly said, lots of costs um, implemented uh, in the, impacting the different stages. 
Um, so I think that, again, is part of the benefit of having uh, a diverse team to be involved so that where there may be costs that may be incurred uh, sort of in country, then that can be brought to the attention during the planning um, and to, so that we can back to that in when doing funding applications. Because as I said, we, we aim to use this tool to have our plans in place to then go for the funding for them. And by having um, our local teams involved in the planning of this and also involved in those funding applications, it can help us to address if there are points where there may be sort of um, country-related funding that's needed for things like licenses or that sort of thing, um, to help us to understand that early on and make sure it's put in. Does that answer your question? <coughs> Mm, sort of, <laughs> but maybe this is quite an in-depth question that Cesare is asking here, so maybe some of that might need to be taken in offline into detail as well. But um, because now I have the mic, right, and I'm talking. Um, but actually, sort of following on from that, I wondered if you had any insights to whether you felt funding bids were more successful because you could say, hey, we've used the conservation standards, here is our theory of change. Like, are you able to have enough experience to say, ah, oh, yeah, if we hadn't use this standard, then and this model, we feel like our funding bid wouldn't have been so successful? I think I don't have enough experience, I think, on that side to know how much of an impact it had on the outcome. Um, we have had certainly some very successful funding bids, and I do think that even if it didn't necessarily from the perspective of the funding body, because I don't know the feedback or whether that was what led them to their decision. But I certainly think that from our side, it's contributed to writing what we feel are stronger applications. So being able to put in sort of better support for the things that we're saying that we're gonna do, we've got a very clear outline of the actions that we need to do. Um, so I think whether or not from a funder's perspective, they have necessarily said we're we're going for this one because it's got conservation standards plan. But I think from a, fundra a fundraising and grant application perspective, I think it's helped us feel that we've written very strong applications. Um, unfortunately, because I'm not from the sort of funding side, I'm not sure how much it, that's come through on the other side. But certainly, I think it's helped in our strength of application writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the family? Can I ask another question now, actually? And I think you gave us lots of really good examples of success and examples of why we should do this. To some extent, we're maybe speaking to an engaged audience here. But if you could say, like, what was the, what would be the key deciding factor that made the directorial team, the board, say, yep, yeah, we're going to invest in doing this for our project? What would be the one thing that you feel was changing in that senior director board mind? Um, again, so this was before my time. It was when we were looking at launching our current strategy. Um, and, but I think a, a key thing was having, having certainly clear ways of evaluating our impact so being able to you know look at exactly what we're doing and keeping track of the impact it's having and I think really the the just overall benefit of being able to keep on adapting and changing as needed was a really sort of attractive aspect of this tool and um, what the kind of final driving factor that made them say, yes, we're going to do this. Um, unfortunately, I don't actually know what that was um, because, it, as I said, it was before my time when they were developing this strategy. Um, but it was, yeah, I think that's sort of the consistency and the, the strong planning that leads to strong evaluation. Super, yeah. I mean, thank you. And, and I don't know whether there's anybody else in the room also able to ask this question. Because for me, it's always a really valid one, isn't it? What is it that really made that director say yes? But does anybody else in the room have an example? Yeah. What made you say yes, Chesney? Maybe that's not what we're talking about. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. Um, I just have one final question, I guess. Um, everybody's listened to how the conservation standards work. What would you say would be the next step for any of our participants if they want to think it would be a good idea for their zoo, for their conservation strategy? What would be the best next step to get involved? Yeah, I think, um, so as I said, this, this will be shared and there's, I think the, the best thing is to like look into those resources that are available um, and reaching out to um, the Conservation Coaches Network would be really helpful. As I said, there are a huge number of them across the world and there's regional ones. So um, reaching out to a conservation coaches, a, a conservation coach within your region um, can help, they can help give advice on sort of the best ways to start to implement them, uh, start to implement it and thinking about some of those potential training opportunities, they'd also be able to I think, give more information on costings of training and that sort of thing. Um, or if you are interested in undertaking sort of the five-day training, there's also that link for the Durham Academy. If you wanted to get that more sort of in-depth training that we offer, um, then there's a link to my, uh, my colleague in the Academy who could help you with that as well. But yeah, I think really making, making the most of those, uh, the list of resources and the conservation coaches as well. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, we can go to our break. Just one last uh, round of applause for Rebecca for her presentation. So tea, stroke coffee, stroke soft drink break. Back here at, what time has it been to me? Four? Four o'clock, sorry. Smooth. <laughs> it's going so well. Oh, cool. So it's four in the afternoon.